Susie, hello. Hi, Andy. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too. Thank you so much for joining us. You're most welcome. It's great to be here. It's really good to have you here. Uh, so this is our um, first time um, with a, uh, a guest contributor um, coming on to one of our, our videos. We're very grateful. And if it's right, Susie, I'll ask you to introduce yourself. Okay, yes. So um, I am Susanna Lipscomb and I am a professor of history at the University of Roehampton with you, Andy. And um, I work on the 16th century, as you do, um, but I work particularly on the history side of things. So I work on both the history of England and the history of France. Um, and um, I write about it and have made quite a few TV programmes about it as well. Mm. Um, and could you give us a sense of the kind of work that you've done both as a researcher and as a broadcaster? Do you mind giving us an overview? Okay, um, so my history, my work in terms of books has been in two different areas. So one of it, half of it sort of on Henry VIII and the early Tudor court. So I think about, I've, I thought about the year that changed Henry VIII, which I think is 1536. It sort of takes him from being this charismatic young prince to becoming the uh, obese and ruthless tyrant we love to hate. Um, and so that takes me into things like gender issues, the fall of Anne Boleyn. So I've looked at that in more detail as well. And also looked at the very end of Henry's life, um, the, the last days of last years of his life, but also his last will and testament. So there was a great um, contentious debate about whether that was actually the product of a conspiracy. And I wrote about it and tried to prove the, what I think is the case, which is I think it was um, actually literally his last will his, of his own volition. And, and I've also written a guide to sort of places around England where you can engage with the Tudor story that still survive and tell various aspects of, the, of Tudor history. Um, I wrote a very little book, like 50 page length, a ladybird book about witchcraft. And then my, uh, the other side of things that I do is about women in late 16th century France. So um, the, my most recent book was on this, which is called The Voices of Nîmes, and it looks at women's lives. And I have had access to this amazing set of archives, um, these records from the equivalent of a moral court uh, the, called the consistory that the Protestants set up wherever they established power in the south of France. And they would um, bring before them anyone who was accused of immorality and as women were thought to be the chief source of sin, it's often women. And so unlike most criminal courts at the time, which are, were not keeping women's testimonies or not giving them the same status as men's, this con these consistories, these Protestant consistories are writing down at copious length what women have to say. And so it's been an amazing insight into moments where things went wrong in uh, people's lives it's because it tends to be things like illegitimate pregnancies or malicious gossip, um, sexual assault, uh, you know, breakdowns of relationships in various ways. So, it, of course, it gives us a bit of a skewed picture. It can't tell us about their happy existences, but it does give us real insight into those moments when, moments when things went wrong. And so... Basically, what I've done in terms of TV often has picked up on a lot of these themes. So I've done stuff on Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. I've, I've done programs on Henry and the Six Wives um, with Dan Jones. And we did a series also on Elizabeth I and one on the Great Fire of London. They sort of kind of follow each other. Um, I've done a, a series on witchcraft. Um, I did a, um, a, a different sort of series, which is much more recent, on called Hidden Killers of the Tudor Home or Victorian Home, Edwardian Home for BBC Four. And that was... Um, looking at not um, serial killers, but the, the things disguised in the house, like arsenic and the wallpaper and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, various programs like that. The most recent one was a, s a series on the history of London. And hopefully, although it is not yet confirmed, so I should be quiet about it really, but hopefully the next thing is going to be about um, women in history. So we'll see. Thank you for sharing the top secret thing at the end. That's yeah. especially exciting. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions we thought we would ask um, all of our contributors, and you're welcome to interpret this as personally or as professionally as you like, is the question of, of what drives your work or what makes you do what you do? It's quite a big question, isn't it? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so sort of most broadly speaking, I think the business of being a historian is about um, empathizing with people. Um, and caring about other people's lives, um, as Trevelyan put it, that, that you know, as actual as our own, and really engaging with that reality. Um, 
And so I'm sort of fascinated by trying to get to understand other people and why they do what they do and um, yeah, what makes people um, feel or think certain things. So there's that. And also I like the process of doing that, which is something about investigating. Um, I like trying to track things down and deduce from generally li relatively limited evidence. Um, but enough, you know, I'm, I, I don't know if I could quite be a medievalist working on tiny scraps, but I feel like the 16th century is a sort of good body of it, but not, but not so much that you get kind of overwhelmed. And... Uh, we'll give you a right to reply uh, to what Susie just said, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm right, I'm <laughs> um, but uh, from my point of view, it's there's, uh, you know, the 16th century feels like the perfect amount. You can get your head around it in a lifetime of work, but lifetime work, but... Um, uh, not overwhelmed by it. But then actually recently I've started to get interested in something in the Victorian period, so you never know. Um, so, uh, so, so those kind of drivers towards, um, I mean, it's obviously, it's a very difficult, loaded word in the context, but, but truth, most broadly speaking, in terms of truth of people's experiences and trying to, to figure out how to read evidence, how to think about things critically and so yeah, I mean, uh, and also just because I love the fact that it, on a day-to-day -day basis, my my job involves two very different modes of being. One is kind of sat here or in a, a library or an archive somewhere, just in my own deep in my own thoughts, and that's that um, I find a very pleasant place to be. On the whole, I'm sorry, I argue with myself a lot, but but at least I like being on my own or like working. But I also really like working with people, and so. Um, teaching students or um, working in TV giving the opportunity to also kind of do that stuff where I'm interacting and that that's the kind of perfect balance. Yeah I'd love to talk more about that if that's okay that balance between the two um, but the, fir the, the first question leading on from what you've just said is um, the idea of getting close to the truth of lived lives. Um, it feels like one of the many things that's distinctive about your work is that that laser light focus on the one hand on um, an English world of power. And then with your most recent book, with um, very different um, social strata, very different kinds of community. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us a bit about what that felt like as a shift. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but that feels like that's quite a distinctive shift. Yes, well, it's, it's actually, the, the chronology is even more complex because I was working on the French staff before I started working on um, okay. early, um, the early Tudor court. So in actual fact, I, I skipped backwards in time and went up the social hierarchy um, and then have kind of come um, back down and forwards in time. Um, but in actual fact, I found it very useful to do that because very few people do look at uh, nobility and monarchy and also work on social history of ordinary people. And the two speak to each other a lot more than we perhaps necessarily always know and actually across Europe as a whole and even across status there's a certain continuity of values um this is a time of great change but there is there are there are um aspects of behavior so for example after having having started work on the French stuff and thinking a lot about sexual honor um and um the treatment of women in France in this period of time. Then when I came to think about Henry VIII, I realized that what was so crucial and sort of often overlooked um, in terms of thinking about his degeneration was actually that a lot of the events of this one year and, and also been looked at thematically, so no one had kind of considered the lived effect of these things being in chronology of these terrible things that happened to him. A lot of them were to do with sexual honor actually that he that the resulting impact for him was a kind of crumbling sense of his own masculinity and that that undoubtedly changed how he responded to threats for the rest of his life um and so the the two have kind of talked to each other um but i suppose that they also when i'm working on the, the, the different state of the of the fields is quite extraordinary. So, of course, the Tudor period, the, the early Tudor period, Henry VIII's court, is massively um, 
studied and has been for centuries. And I, when I was first deciding what I was going to do my doctorate in, which was on the French history, I chose not to do 16th century England because I thought it was so overstudied. So the irony of me coming back to it is great. But anyway, um, uh, the, and most, you know, most of the sources have been typed, uh, printed, uh, summaried in these, these calendar paper, letters and papers, the state papers from the 19th century. Whereas when I'm working with my French stuff, it's all absolutely in manuscript, um, in 16th century French, uh, in little remote uh, provincial archives. And there is no you know, beautifully produced edition. Like I sort of probably ought to do an edition of one of these things. Um, we don't tend to get so much credit academically for doing that sort of thing these days, but that's a technical point. But anyway, but but you know, it would be nice to have uh, a, a French uh, a transcription and an English translation of one of these sources out in the world for students to use, etc. So the state of the research is very, very different. With the with the with the Tudor stuff, I'm doing. I'm looking at things that loads of people have looked at before, and the chances of me finding a source that no one's read are very very slim. Whereas my French stuff. I think I'm a, you know, in some cases, I may be like the, uh, well, certainly within half a dozen people have read them over the time, you know, since they were created. So that's, that's quite extraordinary. Okay. So yeah, thematically, actually, the two worlds are more similar than I might have thought in terms of the link of sexual honor that you're talking about. But the actual experience for you as a researcher is um, completely opposite, where you're dealing with a very, very, um, you know, a, a topic around which lots and lots of other scholars cluster. And then on the other hand, where you have this um, much more immediate access to material that no one else is, is looking at. And if people have looked at it before with the with my French material, it's been they've had a completely different agenda in mind. So they've been writing about ecclesiastical history. They've been writing about the formation of the Protestant church and the power the church could wield. And what I've tried to do with the sources is essentially read them against the grain and try and find out what they tell us about the women who are being subjected to this. And that, frankly, if I went back now, if I had could have my time all over again, you know, seven months reading one particular set of uh, sources and lots since, um, I would obviously find out all about the men as well. But anyway, but, you know, there we go. Um, or our interests change over time. But the, you know, focusing on their experience as women um, and um, their experience in before the church court has was was not, was kind of my interest, and it tells a very different story to um, you know the, the, the church had this power. In fact, often it shows quite the contrary story that they didn't have as much power as they purport to have. Yeah, is uh, and talking of the church, is there another link between your two worlds that they're both worlds thinking about um, new forms of Christian uh, worship and identity alongside? Um, questions about communities of gender as well. You've got um, the Queen in Henry's court, Anne Boleyn in Henry's court, advocating for Protestantism. Um, and then uh, likewise, you've got a, a community defining itself as, as Protestant against an otherwise Catholic France. Is That's that exactly link? right. Yes. And, and the, the community, uh, this, this more Protestant minority in, in France is very much in a sort of sea of, of Catholicism. Yes, absolutely. The Reformation is the link. And um, so, yes, religion and gender are, kind of, are the two poles around which I'm moving, I suppose, with, these, with this work. Um, and the other thing that I'd say that I'd throw in, particularly with the Tudor stuff, but that's because I used to be a curator at Hampton Court Palace, but I've now been applying it to my other work as well, is that I think it's really important also to, to re retain something of the stuff of the past, to put it in a most prosaic way, like to, you know, to think about um, uh, the places in which these things happened and the spaces and the things that people owned, their possessions, as much as we can, because it's so easy um, otherwise to kind of float off into the world of ideas and not ground it back in to the reality of people's lives. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I second that from my own um, kind of research position as well. I think that's wonderful that um, that's such a, a large part of your work. It's so important, I think. Um, one of the things I'm hoping that these videos will do, if we're able to capture people's interest, is connect research to a public audience. And that's obviously, obviously something that you do yourself um, in your day job. But I'm just thinking that even just hearing that it, it takes seven months of working with an archive to tease out some of the voices that you were looking for and some of those lived realities. I mean, I, I don't know but my sense is, but lots of people picking up an academic book, um, a public facing academic book or, or not. Um, 
it's quite hard to get a sense, I think, if you're in that position of what work has gone into that. Yes, um, and actually, I think that maybe we'll see a change in this. I mean, the academic voice has been one that's very much um, been like the swan, you know, floating down the river with the, uh, just with the uh, feet underneath paddling fast, rather than revealing <laughs> those kind of processes. And it's all very, it's presented as kind of seamlessly um, connected. And a, a book that I've been inspired by in the last few years was The Hair with Amber Eyes, a popular book that sold really well, or something like The Cutout Girl, another book that's similar, where actually it's a story of historical research, but the author's voice is intertwined and their process of research is um, also foregrounded. So that actually you sort of take the reader on something of that store, that adventure as well. Um, uh, so I, I do think it's very easy not, you know, I remember reading, uh, I mentioned Dan Jones earlier, who's a friend and collaborator of mine, and he had writes these brilliant narrative history books. And I remember reading one um, of his books, I think the Plantagenets, and there's a paragraph about um, a library. I can't even remember any of the details of it, of, of the, but I remember reading that this paragraph and thinking, that paragraph would have taken the research behind that paragraph. It would have taken huge amounts of time to be, <laughs> to be able to describe this me medieval library um, uh, where a couple of his protagonists spent some time. And, uh, and yet it's all completely, you know, in the footnotes, you can just about find some of the, some of the traces of how long that took, but it's all subsumed. And so, in some ways with narrative history, that's part of the, part of the point, you're rushing along with a story. But I do think that's true that research is a, um, it is a little arcane. And I think one of the, just to finish this on this point is I think one of the, it's important to start to own what we do because history or literature, the humanities from the outside looks unlike science as entirely approachable. And that's a good thing insofar as we want people to be interested in our disciplines and pick up books and, think that they can get involved in genealogy, family history and that sort of thing. But there are things that we do that we learn or that, that there are techniques or skills that we have honed over time or been taught. And there's no sense of that really in the world as a whole. I think it's very much, I don't think there's necessarily any sense that there's any expertise to what we do, except so far as we've learned a lot of stuff. Like, and it's not actually the knowledge that distinguishes us. It's that we know how to do it, not what the thing actually is already. So it's about um, framing questions and thinking about different ways in which those questions can be answered. Um, and certainly, I think for probably for you, but certainly for me, um, the kinds of collaboration, either with real people or with their work that is need needed to, to bring a project along, um, the kind of archival work you were talking about, um, is that's the kind of thing you have in mind? Yes, and knowing what questions you can ask of the sources. So people uh, often ask, um, questions that, I'm trying to think, um, that, 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 you know, that, you know, what did Anne Boleyn feel about something or other? And, you know, for, I'm, I'm with you, I'd love to know, but, but unfortunately, um, you know, very few letters from Anne Boleyn, you know, there are some disputed ones, very few letters from Anne Boleyn survive. She didn't keep any sort of helpful diaries in which she, uh, <laughs> Dear diary, today Henry VIII sent me, <laughs> sent me a token of his affection, and, and this is what I'm feeling about him, um, uh, or any of that sort of stuff. So it's about knowing what the sources, what sources are out there, and what questions you can ask of them to determine what you can ask of the past. You know? Yeah. So to go back to your swan analogy, some of us need to be swans upside down with the legs <laughs> in the air. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, my way anyway. Yeah. Should we volunteer, Andy? <laughs> the upside down swans. <laughs> Susie, you've been so eloquent and brilliant. Thank you very much. May I end by asking you the question we think we're going to ask all of our contributors as we wrap up the video, which is um, we're asking them um, what, what, uh, what, how they would describe literature, what the word literature might mean to them. We're kind of framing these videos um, under the umbrella term of a bit lit um, and putting that idea out there of what we might mean by literature. So if it's okay, may I ask you that question? What, what does that term mean to you? It's a pretty broad question as well, because immediately I start to think of the fact that well, my, one of my favourite bookshops in the world, Blackwell's in Oxford, separates out literature from fiction, which I always thought was, you know, so wh wh at what point do you get to move into literature? Do you sort of like you get upgraded? Um, and 
so in some ways I suppose we think of it as I'm looking at my literature above above your head as it were on my shelves behind you um which is uh, yeah, yes have a look which is you know whether it's I don't know Victor Hugo or uh uh Goresworthy or you know they're just sort of like the, the the names of classics um but in history of course literature also means what people have written about the past or um so it's a sort of the writing about the history um, and so you know what does the literature say literature reviews our students get given um, so and so broadly so that doesn't really give you a summary of it does it at all um, uh, right. I'm sorry it's well, a broad question so I guess therefore broadly speaking it seems to have more than one sense it's kind of what is classic and has been esteemed um, by generations, um, and then I guess you're more generally speaking, and then within my subject, it's also that as well. Really, it's what has, it's how we talk about um, the past. It's what uh, the discourse about the past has been, if that makes sense. Yeah, it sort of brings you back to the point you're making earlier about um, the stuff of of lived lives. In that, one of the reasons we talk about prehistory as opposed to history is prehistory is sort of the period before stuff gets written down. Um, and so history, in a way, is quite a literary art form as usually practiced, but it tends to be about written documents. But as you've reminded us, history is also clothing and um, objects and belongings and um, the spaces around us. Yes, and I think that perhaps as we're, the danger is that we're so drawn to the documents that we forget about the other stuff and that it can tell us stories that actually run counter to the documents and uh, and that sort of thing so or the texts depending on how you look, want to talk about it so um yes it's good to be reminded that we we have to look outside history or literature per se yeah definitely thank you so much Susie, for joining us it's been really fun yeah, you're welcome it's been great thank you thank you take care <laughs>